Amen. What a precious family. Hallelujah. Y'all pray for them. They're doing a great job of raising their children, but how many of you know the enemy would come in like a, like a thief to try to kill, steal, and destroy? And uh, we need to pray for all of our families and their little children, and God will help them to raise them in the ways of the Lord in this last days. How many of you know we're in the last days? And we need to serve God with all of our heart, all of our strength, all of our mind, all of our soul. Amen? Amen. Why don't you take your Bibles today, and, and I want you to turn with me. And I left my little Bible. I'd used it for a funeral. And I left it in the car and then took it in the house and forgot it, so I had to bring the big one. And I don't ever like to come to the pulpit without a Bible. I know it's all on this iPad and it's all there. But you just always like, I like to have the Word. How many of you know I love my sword? And uh, thank God for it. This is one of those fire Bibles that... Uh, this was the English version, <laughs> and uh, uh, this is one that they gave me whenever they came through last time, I think it was, or the year before, but uh, when we did the Fire Bible Challenge and we raised funds for that. But, you know, we send Bibles all around the world through our church. Uh, we've already given over $10,000 in the last couple of years, isn't that awesome, to reaching people around the world with the gospel. These don't go in the hands of just the church people. These Bibles go into the hands of pastors that don't have the opportunity to go into the colleges and get trained and taught. And they have so many footnotes and great things to help keep them on track so that they don't start preaching some false doctrine. How many of you know we will be careful about that? Amen? Amen. Take today and look at Exodus 13 with me, if you will. Uh, and I want to share with you a message today that uh, the Lord laid on my heart. And uh, I, I guess it must be summertime. I guess a lot of our families are vacationing and having a great time. School's out. Well, I am so glad you're here. And I hope that you receive a blessing today from God's Word. I might have to preach this message again when they all get back. I, I want them to hear it too. Amen. But listen as I, I share with you today. How many of you want to have a blessed life? What about the rest of you? Let me say it one more time. How many of you want to have a blessed life? I want my life to be blessed of God. I want to have His blessings on it. And to have a blessed life, we must learn to put God first in everything that we do. Can I hear it? Amen. amen. You see, if I ask you today, is God first in your life? Most of you would say, why, sure, Pastor, He's first. I didn't ask you the question yet, but you stop and ponder that thought for a moment. Is God really first in your life? Are there other things in your life that stand in front of God? Do you put other things ahead of God in your life? Well, I want to talk about putting God first because if you want to be blessed, He must be first in our life. And so as we look at this thought, let me just ask you, if I said to you, let me look at your bank statement or your credit card statement, if I, if I was to ask you that, what might we find that is First in your life besides God. Hmm. Are there other things? Some of you might say it was Sam's. <laughs> Some of you might say it was Walmart. <laughs> How many of you know that's the way it goes if you look at the checkbooks and the check statements? It takes a lot to live on anymore today. And, and we're dependent upon God's help to get through those things. You see, the blessed life is not just about having a blessed bank account. I want you to understand that. It's not just about having a blessed bank account, but a blessed life applies to everything in our lives. When God is first in your life, then all the other areas of your life will fall into place. How many of you know Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Can I hear it? Amen. Isn't that the word? Amen? Amen. You see, when God is first in our life, everything else will fall into place in our lives. Putting God first will change your future. Putting God first will change your destiny. Let me just say, by putting God first, it will change everything about your life. Matthew 6, 21 says this, though, a couple of verses before that. It says, Jesus said, 
where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How many of you know that where you put your treasure, where you put your, your most important things, that's where your heart will be. That's where your focus is. Let me just ask you this morning, is God really the place where you put your treasure? Or are there other things in your life that are taking first place? We need to make sure that we don't allow, allow ourselves to put other things ahead of God. God needs to be number one. Did you know that there are over, or about, let me just say about 500 verses in the Bible on prayer? How many of you knew that? 500 verses in the Bible on prayer. Matter of fact, there's about 500 verses in the Bible on faith. And there are over 2,000 verses in God's Word that deal with money and finances. Isn't that amazing? That's a lot. Eight times more. Could you imagine? God knew that money would dictate our life. God knew that money would play a big part in our lives, didn't he? He addressed it in his word. He did it in a way so that he could teach us and to train us. Now, your prayer life and your faith life will never get straightened out if your money life never gets on track. So I want to talk to you today about your finances for just a minute. Say, Pastor, we came to hear about Jesus. Let me just say, if you can't get this right, you can't get Jesus right either. Thank you. Let me just say it again. If you can't get your finances in order, you'll never have them in order. Today, if we were to do a poll, you'll find that there are a lot of people that still struggle from week to week with their finances. There are people that struggle because they've never learned the principles of God's Word and what He teaches. And I want to share with you today how to put these principles in order. Today, we're talking about the principle of first. The principle of first. Matter of fact, 16 out of the 38 print, uh, parables that Jesus spoke on had to do with money and possessions. 16 out of the 38 parables that he spoke had to deal with money and possessions. In Exodus chapter 13, I told you to turn there. Look with me at verse 1 this morning. In verse 1, in chapter 13 of Exodus, he says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. God is saying in the very beginning here, when he dealt with Israel from the very beginning, everything that is first belongs to me. Let's pray. Father, today I pray that you will open our hearts, our eyes, our ears, and our understanding so that we might know you better. Lord, don't let us have a closed attitude to what you're teaching us today, but help us to have an open spirit to receive Lord, the blessed life in our hearts and our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me say it again. The first belongs to the Lord. The first belongs to the Lord. This is a principle that God teaches in His Word. The first belongs to the Lord. Going down a little farther in verse 12 in Exodus 13, he says here, You shall set apart to the Lord all that opens a womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from the animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck, and all the firstborn of, male, of man and among your sons you shall redeem." Three things that we need to understand today, we need to learn here is, number one, the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Number one, the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Now, some of you are thinking to yourself, well, how do I know if we're to sacrifice or redeem it? How do I know? What's the difference? And so let me just give you a little clarification here. If it's a clean animal, it's to be sacrificed. How many of you know in the Old Testament, God declared there were certain animals that were clean and certain animals that were not? You know, uh, a donkey is one that is not clean. Okay? A pig is not clean. Are you with me? Okay? These things, he said, they're unclean animals. Those things are not clean. There were many others that he declared was clean. You see... If it's an unclean animal, it must be redeemed. If you want to keep it, you've got to redeem it, 
with a sacrifice of a clean animal, one that is, is, is not declared as unclean. This is probably one of the most important lessons that you'll ever learn in the Bible is giving God your first and making sure that you either sacrifice or redeem. And you say, well, pastor, I didn't think we were under the Old Testament law. Well, just hold on. I'm not preaching the law this morning, and I don't want you to get messed up here. You see, let me ask you one more question about unclean and clean. When you were born, were you born clean or unclean? Come on, think about it. When you were born, were you born clean or unclean? Unclean, unclean absolutely. You say, how do you mean, Pastor? How come I'm unclean? Well, you were born into sin. How many of you know that we were all born into sin? We were all sinners. And guess what? You had to be redeemed. How many of you are thankful for the blood of Jesus? If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, you would never have been redeemed. You would still be unclean, but Jesus gave his life for you. Let me just ask you this. Now, when Jesus was born, was he born clean or unclean? He was clean because he came from the Father. Remember, he came from a virgin Mary, and he was born of the Holy Spirit through her. Jesus lived a sinless life. Is there anybody here today that could say you've lived a sinless life? Come on. I guarantee you there's not a hand that will go up today. We all are sinners. The Bible declares that we're sinners. Jesus lived that sinless life. And so he was declared as clean. And so the clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. Jesus had to be sacrificed so that you and I could have everlasting life, so that we could be redeemed, if you will. Now, this is why tithing is really personal to God. Some people say, well, I don't believe in tithing. Well, just hold on to your attitude for a minute. Hold on to your thoughts for just a minute. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm trying to say, but tithing is personal to God because Jesus is God's tithe. He gave his firstborn. Come on. He gave his best so that you could be cleaned. How many of you know God didn't hold nothing back for you? Amen? And God's asking us to give our very best and to do that. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his own love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Come on. Jesus. God sacrificed Jesus who was clean to redeem us who were unclean. If we talk negatively about the tithing, then we are talking negatively about Jesus. Ooh. You didn't hear that, did you? I said, if we talk negative about tithing, then we're talking negative about Jesus because Jesus is God's tithe. So we've got to be careful when we start saying, well, I don't believe in tithing, Pastor. Well, then you don't believe in salvation either because Jesus was the tithe. Jesus is God's tithe. He gave his first. That's the principle of first. And we need to understand that tithing is a part of giving our best. Now, secondly this morning that we need to know, the first fruits must be offered. So we understand, first of all, that we've got to give the first. Now the first fruits must be offered. Number two, Exodus 23 and verse 19 says this. The first of the fruits of your land shall, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Let me read that one more time. The first of your fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Notice the word bring. He doesn't use the word give. He says he doesn't use that word give here because you can't give something that doesn't belong to you. Do you realize the tithe doesn't belong to you? The firstborn already belongs to God. It's not yours. You don't give your tithes, but you bring your tithes into the storehouse. It's a principle that we learn. Now, when we think about this, the tithe already belongs to the Lord. You can't give something that you don't own. The tithe is to be brought into the house of the Lord, not to some university, not to some television evangelist, come on, are you hearing me? It doesn't belong to some Christian school or other charities, but it's to be brought into the house of the Lord. The tithe belongs to God. 
If you choose to give to other ministries, that's okay. Just remember that these gifts are above and beyond the tithe. The tithe is first. It goes to God. You see, some people are giving their monies to other ministries. And they see the need there. But they've not yet seen the windows of heaven open in their house and in their own finances. And God pour out these blessings. It's because they're living under a curse. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? Why are they living under a curse? When we tithe, we are allowing God to redeem our finances from out underneath the curse. When you give your tithes, it allows God to redeem your rest of your finance. You give God 10%, He blesses the other 90% that you have. Hey, can I hear an amen? Some of you have learned this principle, some of you haven't. But I want you to understand the principle today so that you'll understand how to live a blessed life. You see, God's not the one who brought, us, brought the curse on us. We live in a cursed world. The curse started back in Genesis chapter 3. It all happened back there. What God wants us to do is to redeem, He wants to redeem our finances from out underneath that curse. When we give the first to God, He redeems the rest. It takes faith to give the first little lamb. Let me say it again. It takes, first to give, it takes faith to give that first little lamb. Can you imagine? Here you are. Uh, where's Holly? Uh, well, Holly's up there working. But, but I think about Holly and Carl, and, and, and they've really got into this farming stuff. And, and uh, they, they, they've got pigs, and they've got goats, and they've got cows, and they've got chickens, and they've got, and they've got you know, they just they become farmers. The big city life. Green Acres is the place to be kind of thing. And they're enjoying it. They're having a great time. Uh, there are moments that they're not enjoying it because it takes work. How many of you know it takes work? But when one of those little animals come, you see, the first one comes. You're proud of it. God says you give the first to him, and the rest are yours. How many of you hear what I'm saying? The first is his. The rest belongs to God. Proverbs 3, verse 9 says this. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and that your vats will overflow with new wine. That's a word from God. He's telling us, if you'll honor me with your finances, I will bless you. I asked you a while ago, how many of you want to be blessed? Hands went up. Let me ask you this question. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass nobody. But are you blessing God with your finances? Are you blessing God with what you have? You see, if you're not tithing, you're under a curse. You say, well, what do you mean, Pastor? Why is this curse? You keep talking about a curse. Well, we'll get to that in, in just a second. But, but I want you to realize that tithing is not the law. People think, well, Pastor, you're preaching the Old Testament law. No, 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 no. Tithing is not the law. Let me just say, tithing started before the law was even invented. Tithing started back in Abraham's day. Come on. Tithing started when he came out of, you know, remember when, when Abraham and, and his nephew Lot, they had, they had kind of separated in a sense because they had grown so big, God's blessing was on them, they went in two parcels of land, and they allowed Lot to go down into the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, if you will, over in that area, and, and, and things were going well, and, and there, was, there was just great things happening, uh, you know, and, and all of a sudden there was wickedness there, and the people came and they stole Lot. And whenever Lot and all his family were taken in captivity, we see that, that Abraham had to rally his men. He went out and he, and he took and he, and he captured Lot and his family and all their possessions back. When they came back, the Bible says that Abraham gave an offering, a tithe, 10% of everything that he had, he gave it to Melchizedek, who was the high priest of that time, in honor to the Lord. He wanted to bless God for taking care of them. He wanted to bless God for providing for them and giving them safety. He received back everything he had. He didn't keep it all. He gave back to God and honored him. This was long before the law was ever created. You'll see even in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter uh, uh, 4 and 5, you'll see where Cain and Abel, come on, they tithe. Tithing is not the law. Tithing is a principle. If you'll ever get that into your head, if you'll ever get beyond the idea that tithing is Old Testament, Pastor, 
Well, if you want to live that and you want to believe that, then you just go ahead and keep your money. I don't, I'm not looking for your money. I'm just trying to help you live a blessed life. That's all I want you to know is if you will bless the Lord with your finances, God will bless you back. When you give to God and you shovel to God, God uses a bigger shovel than what you use. Can I hear an amen? amen. Those of you that are tithers know exactly what I'm talking about. Those of you that are not are saying, I don't understand how this can work. Well, we'll get there. Hold on. You see, when we give God the first 10%, the rest of our funds are redeemed. God multiplies them. He causes it to be blessed. God doesn't take the leftovers. Let me just say God doesn't like leftovers. Some of you have heard me say this before. And, and I'm just going to throw this in here. I had not said this in a long time. We hadn't had this happen. But years ago, and this is especially down at the old church. I haven't had it happen here. But the old church... People would come up and say, Pastor, we used to use this here in, the, in our children, and, and they've outgrown it. We don't need it. It's wore out. We don't want it. Could the church use it? And they bless our church with broken pieces of, well, I'll use a kind word, stuff. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if you want to bless the church, give them something good. Give them something new. Why give him something that's wore out and broken down? Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? Give God the best. Don't give him the leftovers. Don't give him the broken pieces. God doesn't want your lame and your, and your limp and your blind. He wants the best. Can I hear it? Amen. You see, it's the same way. God doesn't want the leftovers. He say, I paid all my bills, and, and, and Lord, I almost got enough of my tithe, and I'm going to give the rest of it to you. God said, no, that's not what I'm looking for. I want the first. You give me the first. And then I'll bless the rest so it will take care of all your finances and all your expenses and all your bills. And probably there'll be a little left over that you can do something extra with. Can I hear it? Amen. I found God to be faithful and true in that. Amen. You see, Malachi says, because you have robbed God of the tithe, you're under a curse. That's where the curse comes from. Malachi says, you've kept back what belonged to God. The tithe doesn't belong to you. That first 10% doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. It's His. It's dedicated unto Him. It's His from the very beginning. Some will say, all this is Old Testament teaching. But I'm here to tell you, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I am the Lord, and I do not change. How many of you know God's the same yesterday, today, and forever? God doesn't change. His principle doesn't change. If you bless the Lord with your first... He will bless the rest. Can I hear an amen? You see, God's not a legalistic God. He's a God of grace. Let me say it again. God's not a God of the law. God didn't want to give us the law. Think about it. You know, whenever Noah got, you know, the, the ark built and everything done, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was... A righteous man but God said this is the only man I could find and he used him and he had grace Noah found grace Moses when Moses led Israel out of Egypt people had cried and they murmured and they fussed and said Lord get us out of his bondage and they get out God takes them and they're down at the mountain they're on the other side now they've been through a few journeys they'd went across the Red Sea they'd had a, a lack of water they'd had a lack of food and God provided for them things were going good they're down at the bottom of Mount Sinai Moses had went up and and God said have the people come up on the mountain and the people said no Moses we're not going up on the mountain we're not going up there we're afraid of that God. You just be the mediator. You go up there and, and you come back and tell us what he says. And God said, no, no, that's not what I want. I want to be a personal relationship with them. How many of you are thankful for your relationship with God today? Amen. But he said, I want to have a relationship with them. And, and they said, no, we don't want to. You just go find out what we want. And, and so God said, well, if that's the case, then here's what we're going to do. And he wrote out Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not... Thou shalt not, and thou shalt not. How many of you know God didn't want to put the thou shalt nots out there? He didn't want to set the law in order, but because they wouldn't take a relationship with him, he had to put some things in order so that people would know how to serve God the best they can. 
God is not a legalistic God. He is a God of grace, and He is a God of mercy. Can I hear an amen? amen. You see, the people were afraid. God wanted to deal with them on a personal level of grace, not the law. God told Joshua, when they went and they took the battle there at Jericho, he said, look, this is the first of all the cities that you'll take. He said, when you capture this city, do not take any of the plunder or the gold or the silver or anything that's there. This first city belongs to me. How many of you know God wants the first? He said, don't take a thing. And of course, we see that Joshua said, okay, Lord, we'll take the city, but we'll leave all the plunder. We won't take a thing. So Joshua goes in, they fight the battle, the walls fall down, just like God said they would do after they marched around it. They blew the trumpet, and the walls fell down. He annihilated the city with the exception of Rahab, the harlot, and those that were gathered in her house. And they went on to the next battle. They went to a little town, a little town of Achan, if you were, or a little town of... Um, AI, thank you very much. Just drew, drew a blank there. And how many of you know that happens when you're getting older? Lord forbid. <laughs> but they were there at AI, and they only sent a few, but they lost the battle. And they began to question, God, what's going on? And God said, look, didn't I tell you not to mess with my stuff? Didn't I tell you not to mess with the stuff in the first city? Didn't I tell you that the things that are in the city of Jericho belong to me and you have allowed people to take that out of that city and they've hid it in their tent? God was not happy. And they would have never won that battle because there was a curse against them because they have messed with God's stuff. How many of you know you don't mess with God's stuff? The tithe belongs to God. That's his stuff. The first belongs to God. The principle of a blessed life is to put God first. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? So, they go through the whole list. They find out who it was. A man by the name of Achan had taken some silver. And he took some garments and things, and he dug a hole in his tent, and he buried them. Well, the only way to get rid of it was to take him out. And they went tribe by tribe till they found out who it was. And they removed all that stuff. They killed him and all of his family. Aren't you glad we're living under grace today? Those that you have stole from God in the past, we don't have to line you up here today. Come on. Can I hear an amen? I don't have enough stones in the house. <laughs> but they got rid of the sin. And God gave them victory after victory after victory. You see, God, all he wants is the, the first 10%. After that, the rest is yours. Give God the first, and the rest is yours. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 says this. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in mine house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out to you, or for you, such a blessing that there will be not enough room to receive it. Let me stop right there just a minute. Verse 10, the end of verse 9 and 10. God says, if you will do this, you can, you can try me. How many of you know that God gives you the opportunity to put him to the test? Right here, he says, you put me to the test. I've said this over the years, and I've made this, this announcement in church, and, and I'll do it again even this morning. If you're here today and you're not a tither, and you'd say, Pastor, I'm just not sure if I believe this. I've made this promise. If you will be faithful in giving the first 10% of your income to the church, and, and again, it's not that we need it or I, it's not me, but I'm just trying to help you understand that God is faithful. If you will do it for one year, and at the end of one year you find that God has not blessed you with more, I will make sure that somehow we reimburse you for every dollar you put in. You just got to show proof of it on paper. I can't, you can't come to me and say, Pastor, I did all this money. If you didn't put it on paper so we'll know how much you gave. But I'm telling you, I will see that you get it back. I have done that for years and years and years, and I have never had to give a dollar back. Why? Because God has proven himself faithful. Those who have put God to the test have found that God honors his word. How many of you believe this word this morning? Amen. 
God honors His Word. If you do what God says in this Word, He will bless you. You can have a blessed life. And, and I'm just trying to teach you a principle this morning. I'm not trying to, to take your money. Please, it's not about your money and me in this church. Please understand that. It has nothing to do with that. I'm trying to help you understand the principles of God and understand that He wants you to live a blessed life. Verse 11 says this. He says in Malachi 3.11, he says, If you'll do all this stuff, if you'll pray your tithes first, if you'll bring the tithe into the storehouse first, he says, I'll bless you till your barns are over full, if you will. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. How many of you know that there's a devil out there, and he's trying to rob, steal, kill, and destroy? John 10.10. 10. But Jesus says, if you bring your tithe, he says, I'll rebuke the devil for you. How many of you know, you don't have to rebuke the devil over your finances if you're tithing. You don't have to worry about your financial situation if you're tithing, because Jesus is going to take care of that. We already see it here. God's already declared, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor the vine fail, or, 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 to, uh, fail to bear the fruit in your field, says the Lord of hosts. You see, if you're a tither, you don't have to rebuke the devil over your finances. God does it for you. Why did God accept Abel's offering but didn't receive Cain's? Well, let's look at that thought for just a minute. In Genesis chapter 4, the Word tells us in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3, He says, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Verse 4, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel's and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. How many of you know it was Cain who killed his brother, the first murder? Why? Because he was jealous, because God blessed his brother and didn't bless him. You say, well, why did God not receive Abel's offering? I mean, excuse me, Cain's offering. He brought an offering. Listen to this reading one more time. He says, God didn't accept Cain's offering because it wasn't the first. Listen to this. In the process of time, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. He just brought some of the fruit. He just brought some of it. He didn't bring the first of the first fruit. How many of you know he, he ate a little bit possibly of his own? He shared it with other people. He did what, it, but he didn't give God the first. You say, well, I give God a tithe. I, I give a little bit here and there. And how many of you know there's a difference between tithing and tipping? How, how many of you know that, that when you go out to dinner... If you tip somebody 10%, they're going to feel like you slammed them. Come on now. You guys don't even tip God when you're tipping. God's only asking for 10%. He ain't asking for 15 or 18. You ever notice a receipt anymore? 15, 18, 20%. Some will put a little bit more. God said, I can live off of that. I can make it. If everybody does their part, you don't have to worry about it. God's not a jealous God. He's not a stingy God. You see, God's looking for us to give our first. When God accepted Abel's offering, he accepted it because he brought the first of his firstborn. He brought the first. God wants the first. He don't want the leftovers. He don't want just some of it. He wants the first. How many of you are catching this idea? Three of you. Okay. I'll preach it again next week. <laughs> Come on. How many of you are hearing what I'm saying this morning? This is the truth. I'm not preaching some strange doctrine. This is God's Word. You see, there are a few things that God cannot do. How many, how many of you know? Some people say, I thought God could do everything. 
Let me just say, there are three things that God cannot do that I want to share with you this morning. If you had not heard anything else, listen to this. First of all, God cannot change. Number one, God cannot change. If God could change, He could get better. But He's already the best. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? He can't get any better than He already is. Secondly, God can't think the way we think. Make sure you hear the last part of that. <laughs> God doesn't think the way we think. He can't think the way we do. Why? Because we think to figure things out. <laughs> How many of you know that's one of your biggest problems? You're trying to figure it out all the time. Isn't that true? You just can't figure God out. You will never figure God out. But God doesn't think the way we think. We think to figure things out. God already knows everything. He already knows the end from the beginning. Come on. God never has a new thought. How many of you have ever had a new thought? God doesn't have a new thought. He, he don't think like you and I. Nothing has ever just occurred to God. Oh, man, it just occurred to me. If I'd have done it, no, God never had to deal with that. Hello, are you with me? And the third thing that I will share with you, God can't do. God can't be second. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. God can't be second. If there's a race, guess who's going to be first? God. God can't be second in your life either. If God was to go play golf, come on, are you with me? If God was to get out on the golf course, he couldn't lose. Matter of fact, can you imagine what his score would be? 18. Come on, where you at, Billy? <laughs> Dan, 18. 18 holes in one, come on. He hit the ball off the tee, it's in the hole, boom. God's the best. God can't be second, he's first. Let me bring you to our third main point today. The tithe must be first. Are you hearing me today? Leviticus 27, 30 says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, it's the Lord's. It's holy to the Lord. Let me just give you an example. Today, if you were to get your paycheck from this last week, and you made a thousand, just say for instance, you made a thousand dollars. How much would your tithe equal? If you made a thousand dollars, your tithe would equal a hundred dollars. Isn't that right? Okay. Let me ask you this question. If you had ten one hundred dollar bills and you were going to pay God your tithe, which one would you give to God? The first one. You wouldn't give Ken, uh, Ken over here a uh, uh, hundred, and you wouldn't give Doc a hundred, you wouldn't give Kelvin a hundred, and, and Tom a hundred, and then, uh, they, oh, by the way, God, here's your hundred. How many of you know who gets the first hundred? God. God has to be first. You don't pay the others first, you pay God first. You see, don't pay all your bills first and then give God what's left over. He wants the first. He wants to be first in your life. If you keep the tithe, you're under a curse. Joshua 6, we talked about Achan and all that he had done and how he held back from the city of Jericho. If, you're tithe, if you tithe, you'll be blessed. If you don't tithe, you're under a curse. It's just that simple. There are two types of testimonies about tithing. And today I could bring up a host of people up here before you could tell you about their tithing experience and what God has done for them. And God has done it. But the first testimony that you would hear from a tither is all tithers testify by saying, I am so blessed. Isn't that true? You that are tithers will say, I'm blessed. I'm bl I don't know how God does it, but somehow he always makes things work out. God always provides, because I put him first, God always provides. Even when it looks like it's not going to happen, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. The other testimony you will hear are from non-tithers, and they would say, this, this is their statement, 
and I've heard it over and over again, I can't afford to tithe. Let me just say, you can't afford not to tithe. A hundred years ago, not really, I'm not that old, but a long time ago, I went to visit a couple that attended our church. They lived in a, in a mobile home. They're, they're both dead and gone. But I went to visit with them, and, and they said, and I didn't even bring the subject up. They came up to me, and they said, Pastor, I was in their home. I said, Pastor, you know what? As soon as we get this home paid off, we're going to start tithing. And I looked them straight in the eye, and I said, you will never pay this house off. You will never pay this house off. I said, if you don't put God first, the canker worm will come and devour. The thief will steal. Things will happen. If you don't learn to put God first in your life, everything under the sun will come and take and steal the fruits of your labor. It'll happen. I wasn't speaking the curse over them. I was just telling them that there is a curse who hold back from God. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? They never paid the house off before they died. It's a shame. You see, the tithe is not legalistic. I said it already. The tithe is not a law to us, but the tithe is life. Tithing is a principle, not the law. Every time you get paid, you have a chance to show God who is first in your life. Let me say it again. Every time you get a paycheck, every time you get something in the mail, every time somebody blesses you with a little extra, it's an opportunity for you to show God who is first in your life by giving Him your first. Can I hear it? Amen. You see, that's the very principle that's there. You see, Exodus chapter 13 and verse 14 says this. So it shall be, when your son asks you in the time's coming, say, What is this that you shall say to him? By strength of the hand of the Lord, he brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both of the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beasts. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that open the womb, being the first, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. I redeem them. I give a sacrifice in their place so that I may keep them, my sons. I bring this to a close this morning. I want you to ask yourself this morning, Lord, what are you saying to me today? What are you telling me? What are you saying in my heart? Possibly some of you here today have struggled with tithing for a long time. I want you to hear what I'm fixing to say. I don't want you to, I don't want you to understand this wrong, but I want you to know that if you've not been tithing, you're not a bad person. Can I say that again? If you've not been tithing, you're not a bad person. You're not a bad person if you've not been tithing. You've just been missing out on what God has for you. You've been missing out on the principles that God says, if you put me first, everything else you have need of, I'll take care of for you. I don't know about you, but I want God's blessings. I want a blessed life. I don't want to live a life that's, that's full of misery and, and trying to figure out how I'm going to make this end meet and that end meet, you know. Uh, it, it's tough. Tithing is not legalistic. I don't know how many times I've said that to you today. It's not the law. It's life, and it gives us the opportunity to show God who was first in our life. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and I will see if, that I will, uh, see if God will not throw open the floodgates and open heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I challenge you today to put God to the test. When you put God to the test, everything in your life will come into order. I want you to bow your heads as I close in prayer.
Today, Lord, I preach the message that sometimes is very difficult for us pastors because people think that we, we're out to get their money. God, it has nothing to do with us and your money. Because, Lord, we don't get the money. It's only you. Lord, I'm trying to teach a principle that your word teaches us that if we put you first, that we will have a blessed life. God, I pray that no one will leave out of here feeling guilty, feeling ashamed. But, Lord, that you will give them a challenge to try you and to test you in this area of their life and in their finances. So that, God, they will come to a place of seeing your blessings upon their finances, upon their home, upon their life. Lord, I pray that you will challenge them this day to put you first in all that they do, including their finances. In Jesus' name. With your head still bowed for just a moment. Maybe you've come here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I didn't come to hear about this blessed life, but I am thank you for it. But, but there's one thing I need to do. My heart's not where it needs to be. I've not been living for God like I should. And I know that if Jesus was to take away the church today, that I'd be left behind because my heart's not where it needs to be. And I've come this morning with it on my heart and my desire to repent and to get my life in order. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, pray for me so that my life would be in order with Jesus again, with God, so that God would forgive me of my sin so that I could live a life that would be pleasing unto you. If that's you today, and you say, Pastor, pray for me, I want you to slip your hand up while heads are bowed for just a moment. Amen. Anybody else? Yes. Amen. You can put your hand down. Anybody? Okay. In the balcony. Anybody else? Lord, I lift up to you those that raised their hands this morning. God, they want to make sure beyond the shadow of a doubt that their heart's right with you. And Lord, just before we go into communion, all of us need to examine our hearts according to your word. And so today we do that. Look on us today, Father. If there's anything in our life that stands between you and us, Lord, we ask for forgiveness. Is there anybody else that would say, Pastor, pray for me? I just feel like maybe I need to wait one more moment. Anybody else? Okay, I saw your hand up in the balcony already. Anybody else? Anybody else? I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I love you with all my heart, all my soul, and all my strength. I want to spend eternity with you. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just before we do communion, let me just say to you that prayed that prayer and really meant it. The prayer is just the beginning. That's not the end. You need to develop a relationship with Jesus. God spoke to the Israelites when they were at the bottom of Sinai, and He said, look, will you come up on the mountain with me? Will you come on up and have fellowship with me? And the people refused. Let me challenge you. Take time to read the Word of God. Take time to pray. Take time to spend with God and develop a relationship with Him. Find yourself in church on a regular basis so that you can grow and mature in your relationship with God. Because if you walk out of here and you don't enter these doors again, the world's going to captivate you again. You're going to wind up going right back into the world with sin and things that are going to pull you down. I challenge you, grow in God. Grow in the Lord. Amen? Amen. If the men that are going to serve would come, if you'll come and stand here. Miss Betty, if you can come and prepare yourself. As they're coming, I'd like to read this passage of Scripture found in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, Jesus had spoken to his disciples, and Paul records this word. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord is an unworthy, in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and of the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Let me just say, we've already searched our hearts this morning. But maybe you didn't a while ago make that decision. It's not too late. While we're serving communion, the Bible teaches us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. Just ask you, as we serve communion, if you'll hold all the elements until we've all been served and we'll partake together. If you're not a member of the church, we still invite you to take communion with us if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're a part of the body of Christ. And if you need to get your heart right, this is a good time to search God as Miss Betty comes and ministers in song.